Hi YouTube, it's Kathy, and this is my weekly entertainment wrap-up for October 16th through 22nd. This week I read one book, I watched three shows, I watched six movies, and I listened to one book. The book I finished this week is called The Stars in Our Eyes. I didn't really know much about this going into it. I was contacted to see if I wanted to do an Instagram review of it for this week because it was published this week and I saw that it was sci-fi and I saw that it had queer characters, so I went, yes, I would like to do that, please. That means I was in no way prepared for the fact that this is an alien invasion book. This one jumps around in the timeline a little bit, to the point where in the arc I was reading I think that some of the details might have been incorrect, but I hope that's something that's cleaned up in the published copy. As we meet our main character, whose name is Kalei, it's spelt like this, I think it's pronounced Kalei, I'm not entirely sure. But as we meet her she is very confused because she's woken up in a warehouse and she doesn't know how she got there and she's kind of injured, and she has a thought that she probably wants to get out of this warehouse and get back to her girlfriend because why is she here? She can't even remember the last time she saw Tess, who is her girlfriend. As she's trying to escape the situation, she's kind of ruminating on her relationship with Tess and how they are so in love, to the point where she gave up her previous life to be with Tess because when she brought Tess back to her parents, her parents immediately kicked her out of the house. This becomes a quest to get back to Tess, which obviously has some difficulties because there are aliens patrolling and they will kill you on sight. Also, there's other humans, but you don't know if you can trust them. Finding supplies is quite difficult. But she does meet a couple of companions on the way. One of them is a dog, so if you love dog stories, there's that. And then one of them is this guy who just stumbled upon her camp, and she has an immediate attraction to him, which is kind of a problem when she is looking for her girlfriend. She also has no idea if she can trust this guy, so she errs hard on the side of I cannot trust this guy ever, and that comes with some interesting things that happen throughout the text. This did have some interesting turns I did not see coming, and I hope that all of the timeline related things that I kind of noted as I was reading it were finished for the published edition because anything like that tends to take me out of the story, but I don't know if that happened because obviously I read an arc, not the published version. On to the shows I watched this week, we've decided to go back to the beginning of House and watch it all the way through. This is one of those shows that I used to watch on television. In fact, this show came out the year I graduated high school which uh, was 2004. And it's one of those shows where I've definitely seen a lot of episodes. I sort of remember some of the interpersonal things that happen, but I have not seen it all the way through, so I haven't seen every character arc, I haven't seen every episode, all of that, so it's fun to go back. It's especially fun to go back and watch some of these earlier episodes because obviously they're the ones I'm more likely to have seen because I was living in a place that had cable at the time that they were airing. And it's interesting just looking at characters and going, I know what this person's ailment is, I know what it's going to end up to be, and also they're going to to say this thing. How long has that been living in my head? Why can I just recall that, but I can't remember what I did last Tuesday? I also caught up with Drag Race UK Season 4, so I watched the fourth episode, which was the previous week's episode, and that was the Cats episode, and then I watched this week's episode, which was the Rusical episode. The Cats one was an improv challenge, and in the Rusical they were actually singing live. Or at least that's what they told us. Some of them sounded way too good to be singing live. I continue to be entertained, I continue to see some amazing looks on the runway, and I'm just looking forward to seeing how the season and progresses. I believe that the episode coming up this week is going to be Snatch Game. I also watched the first half of the first season of Easy Bake Battle. You might know the host of this show as Anthony from Queer Eye, who I absolutely adore. His laugh is just the most wholesome thing and it happens a lot in this show, so I love that. This is a cooking competition show where three home chefs show up and they're going to show us their favorite hacks. They're given a scenario and there's two different rounds in each episode. First you have the dish dash. In the dish dash you're given 30 minutes you're given a scenario and you need to make whatever that scenario entails. You also get points, because they don't actually show points, for using different hacks that make it quicker. And if you happen to finish before that 30 minute mark, that also looks good, as long as what you've made is quality. After that, two of these people go on to the Easy Bake, and this one is interesting because they have these giant Easy Bake ovens, hence Easy Bake Battle. And essentially you're given another task, a much longer task, with little details as to what you can and can't can't use, and your Easy Bake Oven is only on for a certain amount of time within that time frame. So if this round is going to last for 60 minutes, the oven is only on for 40 of them, so you have to have some really good oven management. 
Again, if you've been here before, I like cooking things, I love challenge things, I love Antony, so this was not a hard sell for me. I'm very much enjoying it. And I'm going to finish the rest of it, I just didn't get around to it this week. On to the movies we watched this week. I said we watched six movies, and that is correct, but five of them are from the same franchise, and they are basically the same movie, so I'm just going to talk about them all together. We watched Final Destination, Final Destination 2, Final Destination 3, THE Final Destination, and Final Destination five. When you change the naming scheme of your movie franchise, you should probably make sure it's going to be the last one before you make another one. I'm going to tell you the basic plot from the first movie and then tell you kind of how that differs from all the other movies that are in this franchise. Essentially, in the first movie, this class is going to go to Paris. So they're meaning to go on this plane so they can fly to Paris and do like a school class trip thing. And as one of the guys is on the plane, he has this vision that the plane is going to crash. So he kind of wakes up out of this vision, freaks out about it, and he kind of gets kicked off the plane with a couple of his buddies who are trying to figure out what's going on. And they're like, okay, you know what, it's fine, you'll just take the next flight, but you need to calm down before you get on it. And then as they're negotiating this in the airport, the plane explodes. A person just walked by outside with a cat on their shoulder. Okay, that was awesome. The strange and terrifying thing about what happens next is that suddenly all of the people that survived this crash are now dying off in the order they would have died in the crash. And it's always in a very gruesome and or very improbable way. So this is one of those franchises where you are just there for the guts and the gore and it's very anxiety inducing because you learn to look at literally everything in a scene and kind of figure out how it could kill somebody. In the second movie in the franchise, it's a group of friends who are going on a road trip to a beach somewhere where they're have a great time but then the person that's driving has this vision that there's a big pile up and that a bunch of people die so she freaks out and she stops a bunch of people from getting on the highway and then the thing happens anyway and then they start dying in the order they were supposed to die. In the third one we're set at an amusement park the same thing. In the fourth one it's at a racetrack and the same thing. And the fifth one is a company retreat where they're all in a bus it's going across this bridge and something happens to the bridge. One of the fun things about this franchise and one of the reasons we actually ended up watching it is because some of it is shot very locally. For example, Chad was actually on set the day they were doing the big pile-up in the second movie because that's on a highway that is very close to where we both grew up. The bridge in the fifth one is a bridge in Vancouver. And my roommate's mom also was a background in at least one of these films. I think it was the second one. Additionally, weirdly enough, Cory Monteith is a background character in the third one. I don't think he had any real lines, but I was like, oh, it's weird to see you again. It's not weird because he also grew up where I live, so it makes sense that we, he would be in a film like that, but it's also just, I keep seeing him in things from before Glee, and um, and it's always a little bit weird. So essentially, if you've seen one of these movies, you've seen them all, but if you like trying to figure out how the scene is going to do some gruesome things to get rid of literally all of the characters, you can watch all of them. The end of the fifth one did an interesting thing for the franchise overall, so I enjoyed that. There's also little easter eggs every once in a while, which are kind of fun when you point them out to yourself. Such as near the end of the first film, some of the characters are at a place called Le Café Mero 81. Guaranteed my best friend is in the comments being like, your French accent is terrible, but you know what? I remembered how to say 81 in French, so I'm happy. In any case, that cafe, it turns out, not only does it have a location in Paris, it also has a location in the town that this is set, and somebody in the fifth movie works there. Relatedly, you also see the number 180 quite often, because that was the number of the flight that exploded in the first movie. And if you turn Le Café Merro 81 upside down, you have 1, 8, and the 0 from Miro. There's lots of fun, ridiculous things like that. The other movie we watched this week was Ghost Ship. It uh, was a movie, and it was fun to see Carl Urban real young, because it's from 2002. This movie is about professional scavengers. They go out in the ocean, they find boats that have sunk, they bring them back up, they loot them, they figure out what they can take from them. It obviously takes a lot of skill to do this, but it pays off quite well. Somebody comes to them and says there's this big ship in the middle of nowhere where it shouldn't be. We need to go check it out and see if it's something we can scavenge. And when they get there, it's this ship that has been missing for the last 40 years. However, this movie is called Ghost Ship, so you can probably figure out what happens. In fact, because at the beginning of this, we see most the people on the ship from 1962 dying in a very spectacular way. 
you can figure it out. There's definitely a twist near the end that I didn't see coming and I thought was kind of clever. This was fine, much like the franchise I mentioned before, it is one of those types of movies that you can just talk through and it's fun to talk through with your friends. On to the book I listened to this week and that is The Perfect Crimes of Marion Hayes. This is the follow-up to The Queer Principles of Kit Webb, which I also read earlier this year and very much enjoyed. And you have to read the first book before you read this one because this one basically picks up after certain events in the first book, so I can't really tell you too much. Besides, it took me way too long to realize that the hero's name is Rob, the heroine's name is Marion, and they rob from the rich and give to the poor. And at the end of this, there may or may not be a merry band of thieves. Honestly, I was on a walk yesterday listening to this and it got to a scene where he was like, yeah, but when I make a big score, I tend to like give it around to these different people that need it for paying their rent or that type of thing. And I was just like, oh my God, how did I not realize Rob, Marion, robs from the rich, gives to the poor. Okay, I see what you're going for. Because this is a continuation of the previous story, I can't tell you too much about the plot. I can tell you that characters from the previous story obviously matter very much in this story. Things that you were wondering about in the background happenings of the first story, all of those loose ends, or at least the ones that I noticed, get tied up in this. And I'd be really interested to see if there's going to be more in this series, because it's definitely left open to do that, and I would definitely want to read it. This was fun, had complicated emotions, had really great scenes between people, really getting to know each other, which I absolutely love, and one of the two leads is also queer. That is something that is discussed openly because these people have this bond and they can talk to each other about it, and I just loved seeing that. Because if you're not aware, this is set in like Victorian England-ish. I don't know exactly which period in England it's set now that I think about it, but it's at least a hundred years ago. There's dealings with aristocracy and dukedoms and earls and all of that type of stuff, so it's that kind of historical setting, but we also have queer characters who are thriving, and I love it. That's it for this week. If you've read, watched, or listened to any of these, let me know about it down in the comments below. On the way down to the comments, if you hit that subscribe button, that would be very nice of you. If you don't feel like leaving a comment, but want to make sure that I know you were here, just leave me an emoji or a smiley face if you happen to be on your keyboard. Some people have asked if there's a way to financially support this channel, so I set up a coffee account, which is a digital tipping service. The link for that, as always, is down below. You can like and share this as you see fit, and I will see you very soon. Bye.